Hello everyone and welcome back to another installment of Space This Week, the Monday series where we recap everything from Starship development, launch news and all the other best space flight stories from the past seven days. We've once again got so much to discuss, from the ever enigmatic Starship orbital flight test, the blue Bezos booster makes another crewed flight, Electron soars skyward after some initial launch delays and much much more. This video was sponsored by Squarespace, the internet's premier website builder. More on them a little bit later on, but first, let's kick things off with Starship news. Towards the beginning of last week, the biggest speculation from Starship watchers was the test campaign of Booster 8. With Booster 7 still apparently out of action, our expectations were that Booster 8 would be rolled out for cryo-testing and all that, while SpaceX either repaired or condemned Booster 7. But then, all of a sudden... <laughs> Booster 7 was the one that was rolled out, sporting 20 Raptor engines, the missing 13 having been removed a week or so earlier, presumably because they're too damaged to be used at this stage. Elon Musk gave us a little snippet video as well. Starship Gazer supplies us with this great image of the booster being lifted into the orbital launch mount late on Saturday. The plan, in Elon's words, is to test the booster using the outer ring of 20 engines, hopefully without exploding this time. This means that we have not just a Ship 24 static fire on the cards very soon, but also potentially a super heavy static fire as well. It's all systems go. Now unfortunately, the hurrah of Booster 7's rollout was slightly soiled when a hydraulic line burst on the catch arm system. Hopefully this will be a minor issue with a simple fix. Elon gave a somewhat whimsical tweet on the matter, which is possibly confirmation that he's not that worried. Who knows though. <laughs> we saw the apparent delivery of a new batch of Starlink V2 satellites. A mysterious all-black truck arrived at Starbase, where it spent a brief stint in the build area before heading down to the Starlink satellite loader building, which houses the white contraption that loads the Starlink satellites into the starships. The Starlink loader was removed from the building, clearing space for the truck to enter, which was then sealed off from the outside world. The truck then left the building, leaving the trailer inside, after which the Starlink loader was rolled back indoors. So I think it's a safe assumption that the truck was indeed carrying Starlink V2 satellites. Crews also began to paint the Starlink loader building white, both to presumably match the colour of the Starlink loader and also, more importantly, to help reflect light and, crucially, heat away from the building. We saw the new Raptor work stand quickly taking shape at the launch site. The platform itself was lifted off its support frame and placed onto the ground. Crews were later seen cleaning it and applying some form of sealant or protective coating to its top surface. SpaceX 3D Creation Eccentric created this great animation showing how this stand works. It folds up so that it can get underneath the launch pad, and then these two wing pieces fold up to allow it to fill the space. Speaking of the launch platform, crews continue to clean it and make minor repairs following the Booster 7 Spin Prime explosion. Though thankfully, so far, all the damage appears to be superficial without any major structural compromises. An eagle-eyed Lab Padre viewer caught this test here. SpaceX did a brief test of the water deluge system underneath Ship 24 on suborbital pad B. Hopefully an indicator that a six-engine Raptor static fire test is upon us very soon. Now, take a look at this shot by C. Nunez Images here. Do you see it? No? Come on, it's right there. It's subtle, but it's pretty big. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? It's Squarespace, the internet's number one website building tool, who have once again sponsored space this week. Squarespace is an amazing tool that allows you to create your very own professional website, even if you have zero knowledge of web design, coding, art, etc. Even the least technologically gifted people can use Squarespace. Just pick a theme for your website, peruse the extensive list of pre-designed templates that have been put together by professionals, and then away you go. Change anything and everything about the site to make it truly personal and tailored to your needs. And if you ever feel a little bit lost, then Squarespace has you covered with a huge range of easy-to-digest tutorials and guides. Squarespace websites aren't just a superficial affair either. Their powerful tools allow the creation of sales pages, email campaigns, and more. If you're a business owner, musician, graphic designer, or anyone else trying to carve a place in the world, then you need a website. And why not make things easy with Squarespace? You don't even need to pay up front. Just make an account and get started right away. And then, once you're ready to go live, head to squarespace.com slash to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Go on, 
Follow that link in the description. Take the leap. Greg Scott has once again taken to the skies over Florida to give us all some amazing aerial shots of Starbase Kennedy. Beginning with this overview shot, as you can see, as the weeks go by, the Star Factory building continues to spring up at a monstrous pace. It looks like the skeletal framework for this building here is basically complete now. It won't be long before we'll start seeing SpaceX add things like the bridge cranes, walls and ceilings at no doubt just as rapid a pace as we've seen down at Boca Chica. We can see that they've also began painting the beams white, again, to match what we've seen at Boca Chica. Here, we can see all of the components of Mechazilla, the catch arm system that'll snatch the Super Heavy and Starship from the air. These chopsticks are a fair bit shorter compared with the ones at Boca Chica. And this is speculated to either be because SpaceX have continued running simulations and are now confident that they don't need the arms to be as long, or as some have speculated, it's because NASA won't allow SpaceX to catch a booster in such close proximity to Pad 39A, the only American launch pad rated to carry astronauts to the International Space Station. And therefore, the shorter arms are only designed for stacking rather than catching, which is still more efficient than using a crane, so it's not totally out of the blue. Me personally, I'm 50-50, but what do you think on this? Anyway, I got a bit off topic just then. Going back to this photo, here are all the pieces. We have the chopsticks themselves, which have been flipped over since the last flyover that Greg performed, presumably so that SpaceX can work on this side of the structures. We also have the carriage that'll move the chopsticks up and down the tower. Speaking of the tower, segments 6 and 7 are looking close to rollout by now. Over at Hangar X, which is the SpaceX Falcon building, we can see three well-flown boosters out in the open. The cleanest one, this one at the top, is Booster 1073, which we can look forward to flying very soon in next week's Starlink mission. Be sure to hit the subscribe button so that you don't miss my coverage of this flight. And hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, then please don't forget to leave a like down below. It really helps support what I do here, and I always very much appreciate it. Now, it wasn't just Starbase that Greg photographed last week. We got some updated views of Pad 39A. As you can see, the tower is now a whopping five segments high, and hey, it looks like we've also got two new horizontal tanks. We're not quite sure what these will hold yet, but they are here nonetheless. <laughs> now SpaceX pulled off another successful Falcon 9 launch on the 4th of August. This was the Denuri mission, which saw the rocket launch a single payload to space, the South Korean Denuri satellite. The reason why such a beefy rocket was needed for just the one payload is because this spacecraft is headed all the way to the moon. Operated by the Korea Aerospace Research Institute of South Korea, this satellite will orbit the moon to test various technologies, as well as survey lunar resources such as water ice, uranium, helium-3, silicon, and aluminium. It'll also produce a topographic map of the lunar landscape to help select future lunar landing sites. The name Denuri is a combination of two Korean words, Dal, which means moon, and Narida, which means enjoy. I really hope I got the pronunciation of those words right. Now, Moon Enjoyer is far better than the official English name, which is just Career Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter, in my opinion. <laughs> its journey to the Moon is just beginning. It's going to use a ballistic lunar transfer to reach Moon orbit, and it'll perform at least three highly elliptical orbits of Earth, each time increasing its velocity and apogee until it reaches escape velocity and initiates a translunar injection. The Falcon 9 first stage completed its voyage slightly faster, touching down on the drone ship just read the instructions shortly after liftoff. While on the subject of rockets with reusable first stages, also on the 4th of August, we saw the launch of the Blue Origin New Shepard 22 mission. This was the sixth crewed flight of Blue Origin's New Shepard launch vehicle, which once again sent its passengers hurtling to the border of space, where they enjoyed a brief stint in microgravity with panoramic views of the Earth below them. Among the crewmates were Sara Sabri, who became the first ever Egyptian person in space, and Mario Ferreira, who became the first Portuguese person in space. Also on board was Kobe Cotton, one of the co-founders of the YouTube channel Dude Perfect. His flight was sponsored by Moon DAO, a cryptocurrency organization which aims to decentralize access to space. Hey, Moon, or anyone really, if you want to send any more YouTubers to space, then do hit me up. I'm down. Tweet at me. Hey, everyone, by the way, if you want to follow me on Twitter, this seems like a good a time as any to shill. Link in the description. Anyway, while still on the subject of reusable rocket boosters, Rocket Lab's Electron pulled off a successful launch last week again on the 4th of August. 
This flight unfortunately didn't see Rocket Lab make a recovery attempt of the first stage though. I guess that segue was only a tenuous one. Anyway, this was the second of two back-to-back -back launches for Rocket Lab, taking advantage of their newly commissioned second launch pad that enables them to launch at a much higher cadence. Last week's launch followed the Electron mission on the 13th of July, entitled Wise One Looks Ahead, which carried the classified NROL 162 satellite to low Earth orbit. Last week's mission faced a bit of a delay due to high ground winds, but eventually launched on the 4th of August. This mission was named Antipodian Adventure and carried the NROL 199 mission to orbit. The NROL 162 and 199 missions are satellites named Razor 3 and Razor 4 respectively and are national security payloads designed, built and operated by the United States National Reconnaissance Office in partnership with the Australian Department of Defense as part of a broad range of cooperative satellite activities between the United States of America and Australia. The satellites will support the National Reconnaissance Office to provide critical information to government agencies and decision makers monitoring international issues. The satellite name RAZER is an acronym that stands for Rapid Acquisition of a Small Rocket, which I think is kind of interesting given that its name refers to the rocket that launched it rather than the satellite itself. Though I guess the satellites are classified in nature, so it was either this or some other equally ambiguous name. On the 4th of August, again, we saw a United Launch Alliance Atlas V launch. The primary payload for this mission was the GEO-6 satellite for the United States space-based infrared system, which is a satellite network that has satellites in both geosynchronous and highly elliptical Earth orbits. Together, the satellites use scanning and staring infrared sensors in order to provide early missile warning and defense capabilities to the United States Space Force's Space and Missile Systems Center. The network's primary objective is to support missile defense, missile warning, battle space awareness, and technical intelligence. The satellite launched last week was the GEO-6, so you may have already guessed that this particular payload was deployed to geosynchronous Earth orbit. The Atlas V launched in a 4-2-1 configuration. This number derives from the setup of the rocket. In this case, it had a 4-meter fairing, two solid rocket motors, and one engine on the center upper stage, hence the configuration name 4-2-1. And now you know. <laughs> we had a couple of launches from China last week, both on the 4th of August. Man, what was it about the 4th of August last week? <laughs> the first launch was a Long March 4B, which deployed two satellites to low Earth orbit. The primary payload was the TECIS, or Terrestrial Ecosystem Carbon Inventory Satellite, which is designed to evaluate forest biomass, measure atmospheric aerosol content, and detect photosynthetic fluorescence. Official sources state that these measurements will contribute to efforts to combat global warming. The launch also had a small piggyback payload in the form of the Minhang Shionian satellite. This piggyback payload has been promoted as involving children ranging from kindergarten to middle school ages in design and development, and it was built by the Shanghai Academy of Spaceflight Technology, who claim they have borrowed a logo for it. Here it is. Hmm, I'm, I'm sure I've seen this logo somewhere before, but I can't quite place it. Can anyone can anyone help me out here? <laughs> the other Chinese launch we saw was a Long March 2F. This launch was a lot more secretive. There is no official footage. All we have is this amateur footage of a similar launch last year. The rocket was carrying the reusable experimental spacecraft, which is a small reusable space plane that first launched on the 4th of September in 2020. Not a lot is known about this space plane, though Chinese state media claims that it'll test reusable technologies during its flights, providing technological support for the peaceful use of space. It looks to be a Chinese equivalent to the equally mysterious Boeing X-37B space plane. Another launch we saw last week was a Soyuz 2.1V, which is always a weird vehicle to watch since this configuration of the Soyuz doesn't have the iconic four boosters surrounding the core stage, which you can see in this totally unedited and politically neutral footage. It launched on the 1st of August and it carried the Cosmos 2558 satellite, which is a classified military satellite of which not a lot is known. The final launch we saw last week was the maiden flight of India's small satellite launch vehicle. I'm going to have to do some fancy trickery with the footage, unfortunately, to avoid a copyright strike from the Indian government. If this part of the video is blurred, then this attempt failed. Regardless, yes, this was the maiden launch of the small satellite launch vehicle. 
This rocket has a 500 kilogram to low Earth orbit payload capacity, and on its maiden flight, it carried the EOS-02 observation satellite, as well as a small education CubeSat. Unfortunately, a software error resulted in the final stage firing for only 0.1 seconds instead of the intended 20 seconds, leaving the two satellite payloads on an unstable elliptical orbit, and they were subsequently destroyed on re-entry. It sounds like the ISRO have already managed to identify the problem, so hopefully a fix can be made and subsequent flights will be more successful. Now I would like to give a massive thank you to all my generous Patreon supporters and channel members whose financial support of this channel allows me to create these videos. You may have noticed I've started showing far more detailed photos and videos in the Starship segments recently because I'm now in a position where I can afford the licensing fees for the premier videographers and photographers down in the field, all thanks to the brilliant names on screen. If you want to join their ranks you could do so by following the links below and on screen, otherwise there are two video suggestions on screen that YouTube thinks you'll enjoy, hopefully they're right. Right. 